straight to the top story that we've been tracking for you today. Six people have died and 34 injured in Mumbai after a part of a foot over bridge collapsed near the CST railway station last evening. The incident happened during peak traffic hours at around 7.30 p.m. near one of the city's busiest suburban railway stations. Mumbai police has handed over the preliminary report on the mishap to the chief minister. The report blames Mumbai's municipal corporation, the BMC, for negligence and not conducting repairs on time. Meanwhile, Network 18 has accessed an audit report that was conducted six months ago and this report had certified the bridge to be in a good condition and had suggested only minor repairs. BMC Commissioner Ajoy Mehta has now sought the Vigilance Department to submit a preliminary, preliminary report after an order from the Chief Minister. My colleague Radhika Ramaswamy gets us the details of this audit report. A day after the horrific bridge collapse that killed six people and injured more than 32 of them, now there is an audit report that has been accessed by us. Now this is an audit that was conducted by a private consultant, D.D. Desai, more than six months back. And the audit report has said that the bridge was in good condition, which is shocking because several of the passengers, several of the passers-by and people working and living here have been telling us that the bridge was indeed corroded for, for the longest time. However, the BMC did not take any action. No repair or reconstruct, reconstruct, uh, reconstruction work was done on the bridge. And of course, the audit audit report reveals that uh, uh, the, the, the bridge was fit. Uh, so now the question remains that how is it that the audit report said that the bridge was fit? Now, who conducted this audit? Uh, who are these people? Were they qualified enough? Were all the processes followed? Um, were scientific methods followed to do this audit? Or, uh, or, or was it a shoddy job done? Because looks like from what we could assess uh, about the uh, situation of the bridge and about how shaky it was, it seems to be that the audit was in fact flawed. Now as far as the BMC stand go under whom this bridge comes, who had hired those auditors, as far as the BMC goes, they've been uh, taking a few measures which they do after every single tragedy. This time of course, um, they are going to come up with an inquiry report within a month. Today, of course, there will be a preliminary inquiry report that will be out. Uh, a vigilance uh, uh, director, vigilance officer have been uh, uh, assigned the job of conducting an inquiry as to uh, what the issues with the bridge were, uh, was it, why was it not uh, taken care of, what about the assessments and the inspections that were done, were uh, procedures followed while doing the audits. So all that will be dealt with and then an inquiry report will be formed uh, uh, will be out within the next one month. So as of now, of course, BMC officials not really uh, are taking accountability uh, you, uh, openly, but of course, uh, taking a few measures. But the fact remains that many tragedies of this kind has happened, not just this one. There was the uh, 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 stampede that happened in Elphinstone uh, and of course the Andheri Bridge collapse. But the, uh, nothing has happened, although several audits were conducted after that and some repair works and reconstruction works uh, more such calamities, more such tragedies are happening in the city, which means that uh, something really concrete has to be taken up by the BMC officials here and they have uh, to give answers to all these tough questions about the callousness that is being shown by the officials. I cannot come directly. It is, the accident is an accident and it is to be seriously seen. I do not know the details what was happened about the bridges. But I know one decision by the government as well as municipal corporation that the, all the bridges in Mumbai will go under the audit. Now the audit has been conducted. Some of the bridges have been closed by the BMC. Even the ROV at uh, Railroad Pearl has been closed, you know it. Same way, what was the recommendation about this bridge? Who was the consultant? What he has said about that bridge? स्ट्रक्चरल ऑडिट करने के बावजूद अगर इस प्रकार से ब्रिज कोलैप्स होता है तो ये सारी चीज़ों पर एक सवाल या निशान खड़ा होता है और इसलिए इसकी एक उच्च स्तरीय जांच तो होगी लेकिन साथ ही मैंने म्यूनसिपल कमिश्नर को ये भी कहा है कि इसके प्राथमिक जांच करके शाम तक इसकी प्राइमरी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी जो है वो उसको फिक्स करे क्योंकि इस प्रकार की घटनाओं में किसी को बख्शने का कोई कारण नहीं है और निश्चित रूप से अगर ऑडिट हुआ है और उसके बावजूद ये पुलिया गिर रहा है तो इस ऑडिट के ऊपर भी एक सवाल या निशान खड़ा होता है
इतना बड़ा सेटअप है रेलवे के पास ये सारा काम करने के लिए ऐसे में आप सेना के जवानों को बुला करके एक बड़ा चौंकाने वाले अंदाज में एलिफिंस्टन का एक ब्रिज बना देते बोलते देखो जी हमने ब्रिज बना दिया ये सब दिखावा तमाशा ड्रामा शोबाजी बंद करिए सिंसियरली गंभीरता पूर्वक जो मुंबई के लोगों की तकलीफ है उसको दूर करने में लगी है वो नहीं कर पा रहे Ultimately, they said all the bridges have been checked. What happened? Hmm. I think somebody has to be held responsible. In the government, the central government, the state government, there is a hierarchy as to who is responsible for what activity. Hmm. I mean, it is not a, a, a junior engineer or some uh, mechanical or that. It is way up there. Okay. There has to be somebody at the top. At least 49 people are confirmed dead and dozens injured after a terror attack on two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. One of the attacker has been identified as a right-wing extremist born in Australia and he live-streamed the entire incident on social media. The Bangladesh cricket team which is touring New Zealand also had a narrow escape. CNBC's Matthew Taylor reports on the worst mass shooting in New Zealand's history. Well, a shocking attack in New Zealand, one that the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has called the nation's darkest day. Uh, multiple casualties when it comes to this shooting that took place in two mosques in Christchurch. Uh, the attack happening uh, around afternoon prayer time, just before a midday local time. Now, we know that there have been three people arrested and a male in his late 20s has been charged with murder. Authorities around the Christchurch area say much of that city does remain in lockdown and they're uh, uh, urging people to avoid attending mosques today. They've also said that they found some improvised explosive devices attached to uh, at least one of the assailant's cars, but that has now been uh, d disarmed. The, the New Zealand Prime Minister are saying that uh, the nation's security threat level has now been raised to high from low. It's believed one of the people responsible uh, for this crime is an Australian citizen and we understand that that is the 28 year old man uh, who has been arrested. Some changes when it comes to air travel around Christchurch as well. Authorities there suspending regional turboprop services uh, because a number of passengers can board those aircraft at smaller airports without security screening so uh, authorities taking uh, the decision to ground those aircraft uh, as a safety precaution but that's the latest on what has transpired in New Zealand. Multiple uh, casualties in fatalities and also scores of people remaining injured as well. That's the latest. Back to you. All right. Now, New Zealand's Prime Minister has called the incident a terror attack and went down to say that it was one of the darkest days in the country's history. This is a significant event uh, and I can tell you now this uh, is and will be one of New Zealand's darkest days. Um, police, as I say, have um, apprehended someone. They are in custody as we speak, but I'm simply not in a position to give details uh, around that individual, um, that suspect at hand. It uh, has occurred in a place where people should have been expressing their religious freedom, where they should have been in a safe environment, uh, and they have not been today. Now, India's High Commissioner to New Zealand, Sanjeev Kohli, has said that nine persons of Indian nationality or origin are missing after these attacks. In a tweet, the High Commissioner has said, and I quote, As per updates received from multiple sources, there are nine missing persons of Indian nationality or origin. Official, official confirmation on the same is still awaited. It's a huge crime against humanity. Our prayers are with their families. End of quote. Then the Nifty and the Sensex came off their intraday highs but still ended gains of three-fourths of a percent. The mid-caps more or less followed suit but the Nifty Bank was the outperformer led by Kotak Mahindra Bank and that index gained over a percent and a half. 
Now, in the court corner, it was a big setback for Anil Ambani and Reliance Communications in the Ericsson repayment case. The NCLAT has refused to direct SBI to release IT refunds of 260 crore rupees to allow Reliance Communications to repay Ericsson. Now, do remember the Supreme Court had set 19th March as the deadline for Reliance Communications to repay that 550 crore rupees to Ericsson. And the failure to repay this will lead to a three month jail term for Anil Ambani. Ashmit Kumar has been tracking that case and joins us now. Ashmit, take us through what the NCLAT order said today. Well, to begin with, let's just uh, give our viewers uh, the benefit of perspective. Keep in mind that on February 20th, that's almost a month back, is when the Apex Court had directed Arcom uh, to, in fact, pay up the amount of 550-odd crore rupees to Ericsson, failing which uh, Anil Ambani would be in contempt and that he would have to go to jail. That was the sum and substance of the order passed on February 20th. Keep in mind that the deadline for that runs out in just a couple of days from now. March 19th is the deadline. Now, in pursuance of that, 118 crore rupees has already been paid. Now, from the balance money, uh, what, what had essentially happened is that Arcom had made an appeal before the NCLAT for taking out uh, 260 crore rupees of IT refunds, which were resting with SPI, to use that to repay Ericsson. SPI had clearly opposed that. Uh, that was the stance that the SPI had taken. Now, after hearing all the arguments, what we understand is that today the NCLAT passed its judgment saying, we just don't seem to have the necessary jurisdiction uh, to pass orders. We're not passing any directions. And by doing so, NCLAT has clearly held that it is not putting any conditions, any directions on the SBI to release that amount of 260 crore rupees. Having said that, uh, what the NCLAT has also in fact observed as a part of its judgment is that ideally, all the parties should come together and honour the commitment that was made to Ericsson and that is something that should come through, failing which, if that does not happen, NCLAT will be left with no option but to in fact initiate IBC proceedings against ARCOM. Having said that, uh, there is also perhaps a window that has been opened by the NCLAT. The NCLAT has said that the Apex Court, the Supreme Court, is the one that has the appropriate jurisdiction and that's perhaps a place where Anil Amani as well as ARCOM should try their luck. As of right now, as far as the appellate tribunal is concerned, NCLAT is shrugging its shoulders saying, sorry, we can't help you. They can't order the release of the 260 crore rupees. So this essentially means mounting troubles. There is just one working day available between now and March 19 for ARCOM, as well as Anil Ambani, to move the apex court and perhaps get some relief uh, going forward for making that payment to Ericsson. All right. I do remember the Supreme Court is also going on vacation starting Monday. So, yes, a very short window indeed for Anil Ambani. But, Ashman, do stay on. You've been tracking another important story, and that is the long-drawn SR Steel Resolution case. Now, the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal has warned the Committee of Creditors not to discriminate against SR Steel's operational creditors. The Appellate Tribunal has proposed that 10% of that 42,000 crore rupee offer made by ArcelorMittal be reserved for the operational creditors. Ashman, it's a tug of war, between the lenders and the NCLAT now batting for the operational creditors? Indeed, uh, again, a tug of war before the NCLAT. The NCLAT has, in fact, given a formula towards addressing those concerns. We'll come to that in just a bit. But first, the entire appeal that was before the NCLAT was an account of SR promoters challenging uh, the ARS law bait of 42,000 crore rupees. Now, towards that extent, the NCLAT made a very curt observation using very sharp language that this offer by the promoters is bad if not rotten. And with those words, in effect, not really taking a decision, setting aside uh, the SR application, the SR promoter's application, so to speak. With respect to the operational creditors, and this is where things got interesting, uh, the NCLAT held that the principle of maximization works also for the operational creditors, that they too, in fact, should be given their due, that the current arrangement whereby they get only 4% of the entire bid is seemingly oppressive. And that's the language that he used. And with that, he has, in fact, asked the COC to amend the bid uh, to work out a better division of the funds, failing which the NCLAT will then exercise its powers. And towards that extent, it's given a formula that 10% of the bid amount should, in fact, be reserved for the operational creditors. And with that, they have sent the matter back to the COC to consider and to come back on Monday, which is the next working day, uh, March 18th, and then perhaps uh, we can have this formula being thrashed out. On its part, the COC is opposing this uh, formula outright, saying that the IBC mechanism is designed to ensure that secured financial creditors get their due. This is not a lottery system for the operational creditors and that that should be considered uh, by the NCLAT. Arcelor on, on, on its part is saying that this is our bid. Either walk with it or reject it. That's for the COC to consider. So clearly now, all eyes now on March 18th to get more clarity on the way forward and whether or not this 10% formula is a workable one.
All right, Ashmit, we'll have you back on Monday for both of these important cases that you're tracking. Thanks very much for joining in with that. But the tyre industry is under the GST scanner. Sources tell us that the GST intelligence wing is conducting pan-India rates at the facilities of tyre manufacturers and dealers. This, as the intelligence wing suspects, tax evasion on account of differential rates. Timzi Jepuria sent us this report earlier today. Well, that's right. What we understand from sources is the fact that GST Intelligence Wing has conducted pan-India raids on tyre industry. To be precise, the raids were conducted at the facilities of both manufacturers and dealers. And GST Intelligence Wing uh, is suspecting that tax evasion has been made. Uh, however, this is on account of few uh, aspects. That is, uh, differential rates which are applicable right now on tyres, tubes and flaps. Also, non-payment of taxes is also one issue plus excess claim of uh, input credit and there is also uh, an impact of the mismatch of returns and invoices on account of these four parameters is what uh, these raids were conducted pan india some of the major companies where uh, the raids uh, have been conducted also includes uh, jk tires apollo tires mrf and seat however when cnbc reached out to them uh, for a query they did not respond to our queries but let me remind our viewers that uh, gst today as on date uh, is 28% on tyres and it was reduced from 28% to 18% on tubes and flaps. Also, government officials, while confirming this news, uh, said that GST Intelligence Wing is currently investigating the matter. Some companies have already made part payment of the dues, but total demand is likely to be identified in a month or so. So that means the entire case is under detailed investigation. They don't want to rush in uh, with a particular amount of demand. But yes, there is a case which needs to be followed. Back to you. External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj has hit back at the opposition for calling the UNSC setback on Masood Azhar a diplomatic failure. In a series of tweets, Swaraj said that while India was fighting this battle alone in 2009, today it has the support of 14 Security Council members. Meanwhile, in a boost for India's campaign against Masood Azhar, France has decided to sanction Masood Azhar and said it will now push the European Union to ban the Jaish chief as well. Rahul Gandhi has accused Prime Minister Narendra Modi of trying to stop the truth about his failure on the jobs front from becoming public. This comes a day after 108 economists and social scientists raised concerns over political interference in economic data. Tagging a media report, the Congress president tweeted, and I quote him, No more trying to stop the truth about his criminal failure on employment from becoming public. End of quote. Meanwhile, Rahul Gandhi is on a campaign trail in Chhattisgarh and made three important poll promises in order to revive the country's economic, the health care system. He said that the country, the Cong Congress would allocate 3% of India's GDP towards government expenditure on health care if it came to power. Further, the Congress president promised to enact a Right to Health Care Act that would guarantee every citizen the right to health care services, including free diagnostics and medicines through a network of public hospitals. Moreover, Rahul Gandhi promised to increase the number of doctors by establishing more medical colleges and providing more scholarships and loans to medical students. The Supreme Court, meanwhile, has sought Election Commission's response on a plea filed by DMK on the bipole schedule. The petition claimed that the EC will hold bipoles only 18 of the 21 vacant assembly seats on the 18th of April, along with the second phase of Lok Sabha polls. The DMK wants the EC to announce the bipole dates for the remaining three assembly seats as well, and the EC has two weeks to respond. The Supreme Court has also asked the Election Commission to respond to 23 opposition parties' pleas seeking random verification of 50% EVMs using voter verifiable paper audit trail or VVPAT in each constituency before the Lok Sabha election results are declared. The matter has been listed for the 25th of this month. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Reporter's Diary. Thank you for watching, but do stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. Commodity Champions will be up next.